Cruz at our usual time, 9 p.m. CST. So that's why we will be doing this session one hour early. It's more of an exception than a norm uh, on Fridays. So welcome everybody. Good morning, good evening to all of you. Let's get started um, with today's session. I'm gonna share my screen and we will get underway um, with our recap and other interesting things that we have lined up for today. So let's get started by invoking the blessings of God and Guru like we always do. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwar Ha, Guru Sakshat Parabrahma, Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha, Vasudev Sutam Devam, Kamsa Chanur Mardanam, Devaki Paramanandam, Krishnam Vande Jagat Gurum, Krishnam Vande Jagat Gurum. All right. So, Radhe Radhe, good morning, good evening. If you are joining in for the first time, very warm welcome. Uh, we do these sessions throughout the week, Monday to Friday. Uh, one verse a day of Bhagavad Gita we take up and on Fridays we do a recap of some of the key concepts that we have discussed to test out how well we have understood those. So with that, let's get started. Rahul, today I think uh, this is our agenda for today. Uh, recap the key concepts through a fun and engaging poll. That is what we are going to do. And then after that, we are going to touch upon this concept of that if you change your outlook, you can actually change the world around you as well. It's a pretty powerful concept um, in line with what Swamiji teaches us with the power of thoughts. So we're going to talk about that concept, but let's get started first with our poll. Uh, if you can launch Rahul, yes. and we'll get the discussion underway. Uh, if you can please launch, we'll get time to take a look at the questions. Uh, take time to answer those. We give typically about 10 minutes for everybody to join in, settle down, have a good look at the questions and give an answer. And then we will get discuss these questions as well as we um, uh, you know, discuss uh, these key concepts that we have dis discussed in our past, uh, you know, past few weeks. I hope we are able to see the poll. I just launched it. Yeah, I'm able to see that. Thank you, Rahul. Okay, so hope everybody is doing great and uh, you're all geared up for the weekend where we are going to do Ram Navmi celebrations. There's going to be a quiz tomorrow along with the celebrations. So please join in with your friends, family, and test out your knowledge of Ramayan. It's going to be a fun and engaging quiz, plus other celebrations that we have lined up uh, tomorrow morning, um, US time, that would be evening for you, right? Starting, I believe, uh, 10 p.m., I believe, India time? Yes, I think it is 9 p.m., 10.30 a.m. CST, so it will be 9 p.m. 9 p.m., sorry, yeah, 9 p.m. IST onwards. Okay, so we have a few questions. Uh, the opening prayers that we do, they talk specifically about the glories of. So that is the first question. We have quite a few options. The second one says, identify the common link between Newton's third law. Now we have talking about physics and mapping it to Bhagavad Gita. And which one maps to or corresponds to the karma philosophy? And then the third one we have, we can become immune, exempted from the law mentioned in the previous question, which is the law of karma, I believe, by performing, again, again we have some choices, and then the enlightened prophets, saints and avatars of God preach different messages according to the time, place, yeah, it's a true and false, and the last one is the ultimate goal and essence of Vedic mantras, ritualistic activities, sacrifices is... So these are the questions. Uh, we have about 21 participants right now, 25, I believe 24. So they're still joining in. Since we changed the time, I don't know how many would be able to make it today, but uh, we'll give time so that everybody is able to take a good look at the questions and then respond as well. And while we are waiting for everybody to respond, Rahul, are there any announcements you want to make? Yeah, I think the biggest announcement was about the Ram Nevi festival. So the celebrations would be live 
tomorrow, that is Sunday, 10 30 a.m. CST, which is 9 p.m. IST. And yeah, we'll post up some announcements about the retreats and the family, the upcoming family camp, which will be there. Probably Nitin Ji can speak more about it because he has been attending it for a while. But yeah, that is like one of the uh, one of the lifetime opportunities, I should say, where you can spend time with Swamiji for a whole week and immerse, dive deep into the deeper concepts of bhakti. Right. So that is a, you know, a special time of the year where we get to spend a full week with Swamiji right from 6 a.m. in the morning till about 10 p.m. and sometimes even 11 p.m. in the evening. Okay, it's a wonderful, wonderful time because uh, uh, I've seen that Swamiji is the first one to come and the last one to leave. And uh, rarely do we get that opportunity. Retreats, they go on for about two, two and a half days. But family camp is a full, you know, six to seven days, uh, uh, you know, bonanza that we get with Swamiji, uh, including a lot of events, nature walks, dancing, um, you know, the social events that happen. It's a fun fun outing you know it's it's a must attend i would say if you are here in us or even if you can plan to travel from other parts of the globe this is something uh, you would love so check it out uh, i think the early bird is still going on for that uh, do plan to make it um, it will be a lifetime experience for you and we carve out this time of the year we set us out you know everything else can wait so that uh, uh, Independence Day weekend is always reserved for the family camp. So it's a great, great opportunity. If you can, if you can make it, you can travel in to Dallas. Your food. All you need to do is immerse yourself uh, in that divine experience that we get for a week. It's a very, very immersive experience. So if these sessions or the lectures are like a supplement that you're taking, that this uh, retreat or the family camp is more like an injection. You get a concentrated dose of it all at once and your experience would tell you that, hey, something special is happening. People who have been to retreats, they, can, they know that and I can tell you the experience, what you can expect during family camps. Yes, hey, Sandhya, you wanted to add something? No, I guess regarding family camp, you've already covered it all. I I think I attended it for the first time last time and it was just amazing. So definitely everyone should attend it. Um, but what I wanted to suggest was, can we have the intros right now while the quiz is going sure, on? Sure, we have Spence. I see that Spence, we'd love to know more about you and thank you for turning on your video. You're joining us from Minnesota. I mean, if you can talk a little bit about yourself, uh, how did you get uh, associated with JKO, these sessions? And we'd love to know a little bit more about you. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, you know, I've gone to some of the Mandirs here in the Twin Cities, and we've had some uh, Gita studies. And um, I've become a beginning student of Gita and um, have always appreciated the principles of Bhakti but have not ever really found a way to like formally engage in that until I feel the JK Yog um, so far, it seems to be um, some great people that kind of have a very balanced and contemporary approach to it. And so I appreciate that. So thanks for letting me uh, say a few words. Thank you, Spence. Pleasure to hear from you. And we hope to hear from you more often. I can promise you you're at the right place, especially if you're interested in bhakti and some of these deeper concepts. I'm pretty sure uh, all, most if not all of your questions will get answered and pleasure to have you on board. And you remind me a little bit of Tom Cruise and MI1, okay, if I must say that. And yeah, so good to have you on board. Like I said, we'd love to hear more from you as we go. And feel free to put, put in your question in the feedback tracker if you if there's some particular concept you want to know more about. Um, always happy to jump onto a call with you and, and discuss some of that stuff. So great. And like you see, we have a wonderful group here. And uh, we are just trying to walk each other home and, and uh, you know, ensuring that we do understand the foundational concepts and then can, uh, you know, learn along the way in a fun, interactive way. Great. So I think we can give about a couple of more minutes. I see about uh, 29 participants. 
30, 30 plus participants. So let everybody join and participate. Uh, I would like to, we have 82% participation, but we still have participants joining in. Today we changed the time. So uh, I was expecting a lesser than usual turnout, uh, which is fine. Uh, but we'll give about a couple of more minutes for everybody to record in their responses and then we'll get started. Yeah, I think Sandy has a question. Yeah, Radha Radha Sandy. Uh, Radha Radha, um, although I've already answered it a long time back, but what I was saying, I will put in the chat also, I do not see that question window. I do only see all oh, join us, recap, the key concept, did you know the change, the world and all those things. But the real question screen, any inset or something should be there, but it's not there. Anything I'm missing? I, you might want to read on because there might be some connection issue. That is what I can think. Oh, no, I can see the whole thing except that part. I can see the left can screen. Participant list is there. Chat window is there. But I'm able to see the questions and also the responses are coming in from the participants. So I had already responded it, but at that time, after I respond, luckily, I have to response. The screen has gone, and I used whatever you screen you sent it, and which says the whole three three guys are there on the right hand side, something with a binocular is there, but that that real the question screen is missing. Okay, so we will share the results. Maybe it will come back for you. I don't know. Maybe I want to take maybe the screenshots of that one too, but that's what you're right. Maybe you closed it or something like that because we will share the results and then you should be able to see it. Anybody else experiencing the same problem or you're able to see the screen? Okay, maybe you closed it by chance or something like that, but when we'll share the results, I'm, I'm sure it will come back again. Yeah, yeah it should. Yeah. Okay, so let's get started with the discussion because we have a little bit of discussion uh, lined up as well. So what you can do is, uh, Rahul, you can share the results. And are you able to see it now, Samji, the results? Okay, so let's get started. The first question was, are sessions opening prayers talk specifically about the glories of? And there is uh, there's a split verdict between the first two majority is right. So Brahma Vishnu, I can understand the confusion around it because we say Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu. Okay, so probably that's the reason why some of you have chosen that. Well, which is fine. What it says is it's saying about Guru. And what it says is that Guru is Brahma, Vishnu and Mahesh. And that is why we worship Guru. And when we say Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh, what it means is Brahma means it provides for the knowledge, right? Brahma is the creator. It provides for all the things that we need, including rain, grain, and pretty much everything. Vishnu is the maintainer. Guru does the yoga shame, maintains that knowledge as well for us. And then Shiv is the annihilator. So Guru is the annihilator of ignorance within us. So that is why a Guru has a stature of all the three, Trinity, which is Brahma, Vishnu, and Mahesh. So that is the first shloka. So it is talking about Guru. And the second shloka that we do, Vasudev Sutam Devam Kamsa Chanu Mardanam, it is like we are talking about Lord Krishna, who is the original Jagat Guru. The whole source of knowledge, he is the source of all the sources, including this divine knowledge as well. So Bhagavad Gita that we are reading are the words which came out of his mouth. It is also called Song of God. And Kamsa Chanu Mardanam means he slays all of our doubts. The doubts are like demons. They can, you know, grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally, uh, they can, they are very, very, uh, what you call that, counterproductive or uh, detrimental to our spiritual progress. And Guru basically, are, are, you know, the Krishna, he slayed the demons and he slays those doubts through the words of wisdom that he has provided in Bhagavad Gita. And so this opening shloka is dedicated to Guru and the original good Jagat Guru. Guru. So Jagat Guru, Guru and the original guru, basically, which is God himself. So that is the significance of our shlokas. Hopefully, that's clear to you now. Now, next question was, identify the common link between Newton's third law of motion and Bhagavad Gita's karma philosophy. So, action, somebody said, somebody said, action and reaction, somebody said, none of the above. Okay, now I'm going to explain that. If you still have a doubt, happy to discuss that with you. Now, there are three kinds of relationships that we have even in the material world okay so that relationship the first one is injustice based injustice means 
you do something and you don't get corresponding result to that right it's like you are working hard and your employer is giving you peanuts right everybody would like to believe that or somebody is exploiting somebody which is injustice piece which does not commensurate with the efforts that you are putting in or somebody is exploiting you or taking you for a ride that is the first kind of relationship in this world the second kind of relationship in this world is justice based okay justice based means what shall you sow so shall you reap okay so if you sow a lemon tree lemon seed you are not going to get mangoes out of it you will still get a lemon right? so that is perfect justice based that means what you do and you get results correspondingly that is called justice based and the third kind of so it's like you're working 8 hours a day and you get you know your rate is about 40 dollars or 100 dollars an hour and you get compensated accordingly which is perfect justice based system right and if somebody is making you work more than uh, and and paying you less than what you have worked for that becomes injustice based so in this world the second one is the justice based relationship third one is called a mercy based relationship mercy based is all right, you know, some of the days you haven't been able to work, but then the owner comes and says, here's your paycheck or bonus for all the good things that you have done in the past and go and enjoy, you know, or here is some money for your, uh, you know, wedding or for your daughter's wedding or for something, right? That is called a mercy based, which is more than what you actually deserve based on um, certain other aspects. So that is a third kind of relationship that can happen in this world. Now, when it comes to the law of karma it is action and reaction based okay the action and reaction based and which is what happens which is basically the law of newton's law as well right to every action there is equal and opposite reaction so the law of karma actually is action and reaction and majority of you have gotten it right it's not just action there is always a reaction to whatever you do and action is not just limited to our physical drill what we are doing uh, even, even the thought that we end up energizing is an action. So, for example, you may be thinking bad about somebody. You didn't do anything bad to them. But because you thought it in your mind, you energize that thought, it still gets recorded as a karma. And you have to reap the consequences of it in some form or manner. That is how it goes. See, it's like this. There are certain goons who are planning a big robbery in a city. Okay, so while they are planning, the cops catch them, okay, during their planning meeting. So they, now if when cops catch them, and if they give this argument that, you know what, we were just planning, we have not executed it, so please spare us. Do you think the law will spare them? No. Just for planning, thinking, and energizing that thought, there are consequences. Similarly, in karmic law is a perfect justice dispensing system that God has created. And for every action, there is equal and opposite reaction that happens. So this is the key. So those of you who got it as uh, action and reaction is, are right. All right, hope this concept is clear. The third one we are saying we can become immune, exempted from the law mentioned in the previous question by performing somebody said karma so there's a split verdict here these are the questions which become controversial but uh, good at least it will have a bit of a discussion on it so that from here on the concept becomes clear the biggest one everybody has gone with and it's kind of a split verdict a karma second one is karma then we karma and somebody said all of the above as well okay just played safe now the the key here is um Everything is an action and reaction, right? Like we spoke about. Now, when you do action and reaction, it falls into vikarma and karma category. Okay. Karma is something, okay, spelling is incorrect. It is K-A-R-M-A. Karma is something when you are doing good deeds. Prefix it with good, good deeds. Where you are not harming anybody, having noble thoughts, doing charity, being helpful, you know, thinking positive. All that is called good karma or karma, simply karma. And vikarma is something which is bad, when you do something bad, when you are bitter, you have resentment, um, you you have some kind of an ill will for others, or you are, you are committing a crime um, with yourself or others, we can commit a crime with ourselves as well, right, by resorting to intoxication and stuff like that. So that is called vikarma. So both of these have 
basically have consequences. What are the consequences? They fall into action and reaction category. So even the thought, like I said, right, some goons might be planning a robbery or doing something bad in the city. They will, if they are caught, they will be penalized for that. So this falls into karma and vikarma category. A karma is the one which is immune from it, okay? It's the akarma which falls out of it. Akarma in other sense or the other name of akarma is karma yoga, where what you are doing is neutral, okay? You don't have any consequences for that. In fact, it is purifying as well as it takes us closer to God because now you do something with, uh, with the no selfish interest. You are not catering to your senses. And all you are doing is for the pleasure of God. And that is called a karma. That is a neutral karma. Where you are not adding any additional, um, what do you call that, uh, credit or debit to your existing stockpiles of karma. Okay. So the right answer is a karma. Most of, not most, but majority at least is in that, which is a good sign. But I hope the karma and vikarma aspect is clear now. Let's move on. Great enlightened prophets, saint and avatars of God preach different messages according to the time, place and preparedness of preparedness of the people. So majority went with true. Couple of you went with false. Uh, if you want to let me explain that concept, but I'm glad majority got it right. And in fact, it is an uh, overwhelming majority. By the way, for the previous question, the spirituality or the path of bhakti is all about moving from this justice-based relationship that we currently having with God and move towards a mercy-based relationship. Okay, When we are subjected to justice-based relationship, then we are subject to the laws of karma. But when we surrender, start surrendering or increasing our surrender to God, then we are moving towards a mercy-based relationship where God will start providing for. He's not... It's, he's not playing a role of a referee or an umpire at that point, right? When it's a justice-based system, like we have seen in soccer games, when somebody, um, you know, how you basically uh, does a foul play, he's given a red card, right? So referee is agnostic to the players or the teams for that matter. He's simply dispensing justice on the field. Similarly, God is also dispensing perfect justice. It is called we are authors of our own destiny. So, and it is a it is a journey across multiple lifetimes. Somebody might say, why do good things or bad things happen to good people and all that stuff? But then it is a continuum of lifetimes. And which result will come in which lifetime, only God knows. He 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 has that perfect algorithm to know when to dispense that result. So we cannot say some of those results we get in our current lifetime some could have to wait for our next lifetime okay because there are a lot of variables at play so we cannot say if somebody is doing bad he should get the result now god knows when to give it because it's a journey it's a continuum journey not just limited to one lifetime i'll tell you a quick story around it you know there was a if you have heard mahabharat this guy uh, dhritarashtra he asked krishna that what what sin did he do to lose 100 sons in one lifetime Okay, he asked that to Krishna. So Krishna said, go back one, one of your lifetimes. And uh, he had that benefit. He had a boon to go back in his previous life and see uh, what he has done, Dhritarashtra. Those people were uh, pretty elevated in previous lifetimes. Even their lifespan used to go till 150, 200, 300 years. So in fact, he had a boon. He could go back three lifetimes. He said, go back one previous lifetime. He said, I've gone back. I don't see anything to deserve this kind of a fate. He says, go back one more. He said, I've seen it, nothing. He said, go back one more. He said, I've seen it, nothing. He said, go back one more. He said, I can't go back. So Krishna says, you know only few of your lifetimes or none, none of it. I know every lifetime, you know, of yours. And if you go back 50 lifetimes, actually he was a king and then he, he saw some peaceful swans and, you know, sometimes it happens when you see people peaceful, you are not able to tolerate it because of your son's cause or whatever reason. And he actually could not tolerate that and he made them blind. And uh, and that result he had to get in this lifetime. And then he asked, why didn't you give me that result immediately in that lifetime or the immediate after, you know, the next life that he got? Then Krishna said that, you know, for you to even beget 100 sons, you need to have had enough punya, which you accumulated in the next 50 lifetimes. And once you had that punya, you got 100 sons. But now that 
you know law of karma came back to haunt you at that point so we don't know which which uh, 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 you know karma would uh, bear its fruit in which lifetime and we cannot say god we know it better than you in that sense okay but the key of the reason why we need to invest spiritually or on invest on ourselves is to gradually move away from perfect justing justice dispensing relationship to a uh, mercy based relationship with god that is the whole idea so the next question was around the prophets so let's talk a little bit about that so the prophets like teachers you see this teacher she may be knowing a lot of stuff you know calculus and what not but then because she's tasked to teach students elementary students she would limit herself to tell them the basics or whatever is needed at that point so teacher might be knowing a higher she the teacher might be a phd but if it is required to teach 2 plus 2 she will teach that only okay that is how the prophets and saints operate as well they know everything but what they preach at that moment is a function of you know the place the desh kal patra time place preparedness of the people as well and that is why you see a lot of prophets saints when they come they 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 tone down the message to the level that is required at that time for the audience right for example when buddha came he did not contain vedas vedas were being misutilized so he said let's wipe the slate clean and focus on what we have let's work with our breath and our consciousness right and then when shankaracharya ji came he said okay let me build on where buddha left and bring the people back to the vedic folds because vedas are vedas if people misinterpreted it that does not belittle the vedas so he reestablished it picked up from Bud where buddha had left and brought people back into the vedic folds and similarly when other saints came they kept on building uh, building on top of that so if a saint is preaching a message uh, the biggest um, a limiting factor there is when the disciples or they just limited to that and then that becomes the absolute truth and then they get boxed into that thinking and say everything else doesn't make sense right so with an open mind actually god can open up more doors where once you have understood one layer he'll build another layer or bring in somebody or that message where if you are receptive and open to it it will just click he will establish that faith within you as well and it'll just make sense so the prophets they know everything but they would limit their message and it happens uh, we have seen that it continues to happen during the course of the history okay uh, so that's the key message and the next question i think this is the last question is ultimate goal and essence of vedic mantras is so majority said god realization which is good fulfill our desires and wishes a couple of people said that and some said all of the above okay now the right answer is first one of course god realization so all the stuff vedic rituals and stuff that we do you know vedic mantras ritualistic activities sacrifices cultivation of knowledge performance of duties they are a means to an end okay the end is basically to attach our mind to god and love god that is the whole objective of this exercise but if we limit ourselves to only the uh, what you call that the results alone where we are trying to enjoy the fruit and we think that is the whole purpose of this creation and our life then it is again born out of ignorance so any activity these are just a means to discipline our mind bring in that discipline but the end game is to develop love and attachment to god and if you are already doing that then uh, you don't have to think to so you know what you call that uh, basically get hung up in rituals and other activities because loving god is the end goal and these are just a stepping stone or a means to train your mind until you learn how to attach your mind to god but if we limit ourselves to only the fruits of these activities you know i'll i'll do this so that i'll get this i'll do this so that i'll get this that is a never ending game okay it will deepen your belief that there is happiness in this world and then you have absolutely no incentive to go deeper or to the next step of learning how to love god or convincing yourself that my real happiness lies in god and not in world okay the problem happens when we start using the world to gain more wealth or or we use god as a means to gain more happiness in the world which is a never ending game it's like putting fuel to fire it will never happen so the end game for all of these practices is to develop love for god and affection for god if any activity is helping you do that go for it if any activity is not helping you do that reject it fearlessly okay that is a simple uh, thumb 
thumb rule you can apply uh, when it comes to should I do this or shouldn't I should I not do this? You apply a simple thumb rule for that. Is this activity helping me develop love for God? Answer is yes. Of course, you need to do more of it. If this activity is taking your mind to world and deepening your belief that there is happiness in this world, reject it fearlessly. Okay. In fact, we need to reject it consciously. Your mind will say, no, 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 go for it. It will play tricks with you to say, you know what, let me first enjoy the world and get happiness. And then, of course, I'm God, I'm going to do something about it. No, I mean, you're just tricking yourself there. So this is how it works. This is the deeper principle around it. So all these things should eventually lead to, um, uh, you know, the love for God and, and uh, developing that faith in God. And uh, the ritualistic activities are there because uh, that bring in the required discipline in our life. If we don't even follow rituals and we don't even develop love for God, then we are neither here nor there. So it's just a means to train our mind, to bring in that discipline, to acknowledge the divinity and do something about it and nothing more than that. Okay, uh, But it's a good stepping stone, starting point for most people. So they, they cannot be rejected unless we have understood the higher principle and, and consciously started making efforts to progress towards that. You cannot simply reject rituals and other things under the pretext that, you know, I'm going to directly build a connect with God. That could be hypocrisy. Uh, so it is important, especially for the newer generation, you know, people say, okay, it's not needed. No, it's of course needed because we are not there yet. And it helps carry the tradition forward as well. But once you start understanding the deeper principles, then you can transcend or move, move away from these things and start focusing on the real thing, which is developing attachment to the feet of God. Okay. So these are the five questions. Any questions on this so far? I wanted to touch upon... Uh, topic today um, just for discussion so material allurements is not something where we should get hung up and go beyond that okay the real progression is going beyond material allurements and attach our mind to the feet of god any questions so far on these questions before i move further okay if not then it's good let me tell you a story now yes ajit ji yeah, Radhe, Radhe. Actually, okay. in context of uh, action and reaction, mm -hmm. you explained right now, what is the role of Maya? Maya when the things are in justice or as per justice, whatever karma you do, get the reaction. Then what is the role of Maya? Why it is that? So Maya is, uh, Maya, let's get a little technical now here, right? Maya is also an energy of God. Right? Yes. It yes. is its uh, inferior energy or the Jad Shakti of God. Right? Now, mm. anything which is a Shakti, that means energy, is subservient to the energizer or the Shakti man. You with me? No, once again, no, no. Please uh, okay. explain again. When something mm. is a Shakti, power yes. of Shakti, it is subservient mm. or it, its job primary job is to serve the Shakti man or the owner, right? Okay. Hmm. Like when you have your energy, your energy, where do you utilize your energy to serve yourself? Yes. Similarly, God's inferior energy, which is Maya, hmm. it is also serving God. Okay. How is it serving God? By giving a whack to the Jeevatmas who are turning towards it. Okay. So if you look at Maya, what its job is to keep on giving the disappointment. No matter what you do. And tell you, go to my master. Don't come to me. Okay. So Maya mm -hmm. will keep on mm -hmm. pushing you towards God. It's like the sandpaper working on you to file you. So Maya is actually giving you tests. And finally giving you, um, basically telling you that, you know, you, you need to turn towards my master and not towards me. That is what Maya is doing right now. Okay. What is happening right now is we are turning towards mm -hmm. Maya. Maya is telling no, us sometimes we are new. distracted. We are getting distracted as No, we have chosen Maya. Okay. Maya is not, it's like hugging a tree and saying, leave me, leave me, leave me, right? We have chosen Maya, but Maya will keep on telling us, you know, your choice is wrong. It will keep on disappointing us. Like a, you know, it's saying it's an illusion. Okay, don't come to me, go to my master. So Maya is doing doing its job perfectly. We need to wake up to that fact. 
we have to convince our intellect that our direction in which we are seeking happiness needs to be reversed so maya is doing is doing its job perfectly being a energy or the subservient of god so maya is essentially a servant of god in in another words okay so thank you question no thank you thank you sir okay yeah maybe another one and then i'll tell you a story so radhe radhe keshav ji radhe radhe keshav ji radhe 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 i am sorry i am sorry i am really sorry after listening to nitin's answer i am really sorry okay i will talk in person i mean we have to talk later my is told and 15th chapter prashottam krishan tells clearly sarvasya chaham hridi samnishto mata so your your voice your voice is cutting your voice is failing please yanam advite chaham okay is it coming out chapter 15 tells that prashottam krishan alone guides us when we surrender to him yog maya is not at all pushing us to go upward yog maya is triguni maya satogun rajogun tamogun they make us do what we did in our previous lives accordingly as you rightly narrated this story of dhritarast so that's what it does likewise the story of uh i mean like we we have a lot of stories like that so yog maya is not at all pushing us to go up it makes us down like uh, tamagun it pushes us down all the way down any anyway, my opinion so, my little understanding yeah you. You, you may want to turn off your video then your audio will come clearly yeah we can discuss it in more depth uh, Uh, there are we are not talking about yoga maya we are talking about maya so there is yoga maya then there is maya and then there is jeev shakti the three aspects of it but we can discuss mm-hmm. more about it i'm telling you one of the ways to look at maya because it's being an energy of god it is actually serving god by tormenting us and actually telling us giving us disappointment right it's a triguni maya for sure tamas is pulling us down rajas is also rajas is also binding and sattva is also sure. so we can okay. discuss more in detail but it is not yoga maya we was talking about maya yoga maya is its superior energy of god which is called atarangi shakti what we spoke about is the bahirangi shakti but we can have a that philosophical discussion in more detail when we get to that topic what i stated it's not my opinion i always stated what comes directly from maharaj ji or swami ji okay then they explain this concept there are different lenses we can employ to look at this part Uh, but if you are looking selectively in one, there are multiple ways to explain that thing. But I am explained it from a sense that what is Maya truly doing to all of us, right? Nobody will become satisfied. Nobody will become aha! I have gotten you know what I was looking for in Maya, and that's one of the rules of Maya. Anyway, we can continue on that discussion in maybe another session. Yes, Ajit, you had another question before I move on to the next concept I wanted to cover. No, no, another question. Mm-hmm. Adil, Radhe Radhe, ha. actually i am quite satisfied with your answer and the analogy similar to maya in re- physical world is the noise when we are transmitting i am a communication engineer so i i am able to relate in the physical world mm-hmm. that material world the noise it always exist yes. white noise when well, sometimes we say white noise whenever we are communicating from uh, signal from one place to another place uh, noise exists so n- maya is like noise and you have to put the filters to detect your signal so i am quite satisfied with your answer it's a very intelligent reply you have made radhe radhe yeah it's all coming from maharaj you see it's very technically explained something which is energy has to serve serve the energetic so maya will keeps on slapping us after one after another it keeps on giving us a whack okay until we learn the lesson and then by god's grace we can overcome maya because we cannot transcend maya on our through our self efforts alone because defeating maya even though it's inferior energy of god is as good as defeating god himself and we cannot defeat god through our self effort alone and for that we need his, need his grace so maya is a big ocean for people to climb over or to go past 
However, Maya becomes as much as a hoof of a calf when we surrender to God. He just makes us cross over it like a in a jiffy. That's what he claims in Bhagavad Gita as well. Anyways, let's move on. Um, I wanted to introduce another concept today. It's an interesting discussion because we have a hard stop today at nine, uh, maybe five minutes before. So here is, uh, oops, what happened? The story is here. Okay. So here is a boy. He goes to a doctor. Okay, he's having some trouble. So the doctor says, you know what? You've not been eating a lot of green leafy vegetables. And because of which, there is some particular condition that you have. Now, what you need to see is, I think green leafy vegetables are good for our eyesight, right? In Hindi, we used to write an essay that in morning, when you walk barefoot on green grass, it is good for eyes too. So something is there with green. So the doctor says that now from here on, you have got a condition that all you should see is green from here on. Okay. So this guy goes and basically his dad, he's, he thinks he has a solution for him and he starts painting everything. So he gets a green wall for him. Then he said, all right, green stuff, you know, green bottle in green water, uh, not green water, but green bottle, then green plants around and or basically trying to pour, pay, basically paint the entire world green, all green. You see, this is also in green. The font is also in green right now. Now, do you think it, this game is sustainable until they come across a wise man, right? And he says, you know what? All you need to do is the green. You like these gogs? I don't know, it's Ray-Ban or what? So boy needs to wear green gogs and it will fix the problem. Okay. So the concept here is, can we expect the world to change for us just because we believe a certain way? All right. So drishti badle, srishti badle. You change your outlook and the world will start changing around you. Okay, that is a key concept. And that is where I wanted to have a bit of a discussion to understand uh, how can we take control of things around us because things will always not be conducive for us. We'll always have a problem with somebody, our boss, our relative, that friend, that situation, that person we have to deal with and all that stuff. It is as as uh, as good as like this little boy who's trying to paint everything around him green but the key is we can actually take control if we simply start changing the outlook around it it'll change things around us rishti badle srishti badle so some people are skeptical about the world you know everybody is out there to fend for himself and everybody's selfish and the world is like this and that you know when you have a negative outlook every situation it becomes another uh, reason for you or another opportunity for you to have that confirmation bias, right? Typically, we are not looking or listening. We are just, you know, catering to a reconfirmation bias of what we are already predisposed to thinking. And that outlook dictates our personality, right? If we are generally bitter about things and people around us, it even chisels the contours of our face. So if you want to look beautiful, pleasant, presentable and somebody people like to associate with, we need to harbor uplifting, wholesome, healthy thoughts as well, right? So sometimes we meet people and we say, oh, you know what? This seems like an angry, cranky man. Let's stay away from his. And somebody we come across people, he said he looks like a depressed person or an irritated person always. And some people when we meet, they said, oh my God, it's so good to meet them. They radiate such good, positive energy. How is it happening? It's all about the outlook they harbor at that point in time. Because our heart, like an electromagnet, and it radiates a lot of electromagnetic waves as well that people pick up, which we call vibes, right? Vibes. There are a lot of vibe experts as well who can read vibes of other people. So that is the question I wanted to pose for a bit of a discussion um, because we don't have enough time today. Hard stop at around 8.55. So I thought after the quiz, we will have a bit of a discussion on this because it's a very important aspect, um, especially on the path of spirituality to have a good outlook about things around us uh, that not only draws God's grace, but also what you call enables or helps us build a fertile ground to nourish the seeds of spirituality. All right. Any questions or any, any other remarks? Anybody wants to contribute to this discussion? Yes, Sandhya. 
Yeah, uh, Radhe Radhe. So yeah, I could just contribute to this discussion. I had, uh, I mean, I met a person yesterday only and you know, one thing that impressed me a lot was that this person had, is very successful, but what this person has retained is an attitude of gratitude. So while she was describing her journey, uh, what she was constantly maintaining was that, you know, at this stage of my life, these people were helpful to me and hence I could cross, I mean, and, you know, deal with those challenges and hence go on, right? So that was one of the things that I found pretty nice was, you know, drish, drishti, the perspective uh, around the situation, having th that attitude of gratitude, looking at positivity and that just you know moving further with that sort of an attitude which is really impressive and and otherwise same uh, situation i uh, there are people who end up you know kind of just cribbing about this challenge that challenge and not seeing the uh, glass half full so true like there's a saying in english right it is your attitude and not your aptitude that determines your altitude mm -hmm. so attitude is the most important thing in fact even in uh, corporate setup, you know, there's, I was talking, right, there's a statistic that about more than 80%, close to 90% of the people, they end up getting fired uh, from their jobs, not because of their functional skills or technical skills, but because of their wrong attitude, wrong perspective around seeing things around it. It's a defective mindset, which is the biggest detriment for us in our material life. It is not only detrimental for our spiritual growth because that mindset is not a fertile or a breeding ground for wholesome noble uh, healthy thoughts but also detrimental to our relationships around as well because that mindset that perspective once we build that becomes our sanskar and then it becomes a habit and a mindset and it, it just manifests in so many ways um, that trouble us throughout our lives yes uh, rahul you wanted to add yeah, I just wanted to add, like you said, uh, Drishti Badlo, Srishti Badlo. So Maharajji and Swamiji always tell that every challenge can be changed into an opportunity. And if we think that our Kana, our Thakuji, our Shri Ram, Shivji is testing us. So now if we have those kind of thoughts and then try to navigate through that situation, we will be maintaining, kind of maintaining those healthy emotions, healthy thoughts and would be passing probably the test with flying colors, at least trying to pass the test, I should say. Beautiful. Another thing about it is, see, when we distribute keys to people around for our happiness, then we are in a very vulnerable situation, right? My happiness will depends on somebody else doing this for me, right? And then you keep on finding different, different people for different, different situations. That means you have distributed your key to happiness to 15, 20, 25 people around you. How vulnerable you are. Anybody can turn that key and then you become a slot machine, emotional slot machine, right? Duck, 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 duck. You've seen the casino, how it acts. Is that a good slot spot to be in? Or taking all the keys back, like wearing these green glasses, and taking control over everything, right? Which one is a better, of course, you know, just if you think about it, common sense will tell you that this is the attitude we need to consciously cultivate for our own upliftment. Yes, Ajit ji, you had a question. Ajit ji, I think maybe Nilesh ji, and then we get it to Ajit ji. Radhe, Radhe, Nilesh ji. Radhe, Radhe. So, Nitin ji, this really one concept has helped me recently. So, I was like that other guy who was always worried, the first thing that you said, right? But, Ultimately, what I've realized is everything is in your control. If you're angry, it's in your control. If you are happy, it's in your control. If you are upset, depressed, attached. So that makes you, that is like epiphany. And now we, you have to bring that knowledge again and again. If you're angry on someone, it's basically your issue. If something yeah. is not going your way, it's your issue, right? So what the world is perfect because it is made by the perfect, uh, it's a perfect God. So the thing is wrong with the world Everything is as it is. It is your what you have to change. And Beautiful. that just creates a lot of power in your hands and just work. It's a work in progress. Beautiful. I think you summed it up, really hit the nail on this head. I think you just got the concept. Very true. In fact, Ramiji says that our emotions is our own responsibility. We cannot blame somebody else for our emotions. Or, you know, this needs to happen. That it That is a, what do you call that, uh, being very, very immature when we put, you know, that blame others for our emotions. 
we take responsibility that is called wisdom that is the very first step in spirituality that you learn that you are only are responsible for your emotions nobody else is it's like waves we 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 tune in right in a radio transistor the different channels we tune into similarly we have an option to tune into channel p positive or channel n when we wake up and if we are habituated to tuning into channel n then we know where we will go we will become frustrated depressed you know one of those people that people will say thank you very much you know i, I have better things to do you figure out your game plan in life so that becomes a mindset so take responsibility that is the maturity spiritual wisdom as opposed to finding faults in the world and blaming people situation circumstances around us that is a very very dangerous mindset to get into because we are digging a pit for ourselves and and you summed it up really well thank you so much nidesh ji let's hear from ajit ji now raji actually i have got some more analogy what uh, query i raise in the material world there is a uh, examination after studying you have to go through the challenging task right. while every student feels why exams are there that is to check your level of excellence and secondly uh, what uh, statement you have narrated right now uh, with the in the reply to the sandhya ji that it's not your qualification but your character that will reach you or higher level in your corporate world in your career as well so this reminds me the ceo of facebook and uh, apple they they visited india and come across the some spiritual guru got the blessings and then they rise to this extent so and thirdly in material world we see the friction if there is no friction we can't uh, uh, have the velocity or uh, speed right so some minimal minimal uh, energy as you said the god has created minimal energy that is equivalent to friction so all these things narrate to maya true friction is a necessary radhe, radhe. Right? yeah yes radhe, radhe. very nice i think um, uh, you all right in in that sense i am telling you this is a custom hand picked course individualized custom hand picked course for each one of us by krishna by god okay based on what the what are the lessons that we need and if we don't learn the lessons we are failing we have to repeat that standard it happens even in the material world if you are failing in standard 1 you have to repeat in standard 1 and it is no different in the spiritual world as well if you keep failing a test that test will keep coming back and back and back to you now if you are getting bitter that situation will keep repeating with you with different people situation circumstances it could be your boss relative neighbor anybody because you have not learned the lesson and if something is repeating with you again and again it is a sure shot sign you are failing that test there is something you need to change about it yes uh, prabhat ji i think we can take two more questions i have to wrap it up a little early because i have to join other session and i think need to talk there so also yes prabhat ji radhe radhe anitin ji i just want to uh, uh, in uh, you you already mentioned in one class that uh, uh, like lawyers uh, teachers and you know some auditors is having uh, you know they they have such type of um, they have to doubt on some things and you know, they have they need to be judgmental right so in that case if they are judgmental in their professional world so along with that sometimes it bring the same thing they bring into their personal life so yep very true um, so uh, how can they you know what i want to know is how they how can they you know work on that uh, particular aspect like uh, i got your question yes they need to attend uh, the bhagavad gita classes with us they will understand it okay so there was a uh, study carried out the kpmg auditors they were one of the most unhappiest people in you know i think there was a study conducted by uh, gartner or somebody and they found out that these people were generally very unhappy and bitter in their life and then when they dug further they saw that these are auditors and their job is only to find faults in everything okay and they took it so inside their system that it became part of their dna and they became unhappy people now if they had attended bhagavad gita classes they would know tan hari me man uh, man hari me and tan jagat me they 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 are doing it as part of their job that doesn't mean they start becoming skeptical about the other entire world just because they are finding faults in their profession right so that is where spiritual knowledge comes in handy to separate both things out 
Okay, I hope you are answered your question. Last one, Swati ji, real quick. And then we wrap up today's session. I look forward to seeing you on Monday. We will back continue with our discussions on chapter three. Yes, Swati ji. Yeah, Radhe Radhe. Uh, I just wanted to say same thing you cleared just now that mm -hmm. I had been judging someone. I think I was like making previously only why she is behaving like this. But when after I came to know she was little semi blind and she was behaving because of that, then I was like, oh, I was finding defect in her. I was like uh, trying to judge her without knowing what is the story behind that. That is the fault uh, I realized that I should not have judged her before. Thank you, Radhira. Right. Uh, I think judging happens because it's very convenient for our mind. We don't want to think deep and judging becomes an uh, easy thing for us. But everybody has a story. We don't know that. And uh, it's quite possible Krishna is strategically placing them right for you to learn your lessons. So when we start focusing more on ourselves and we are very strict with other, uh, others and lenient with ourselves, spirituality tells us just flip it around. Become lenient with others and be strict with yourself. And when you start filling yourself with the one tool that one can practice, which can take away all the negativity in life is an attitude of gratitude. If we are grateful, we are so full of positivity, then we have no room left for becoming negative, skeptical about other things. So gratitude is a great practice. Maybe maintain a journal, count the blessings we have gotten in life uh, without worrying about you know people, circumstances, situations, because everybody is fighting a battle. We don't know their story, right? And uh, it could be, it is always an opportunity for us to uplift ourselves and work on ourselves as opposed to getting hung up in finding faults in others. So it would just convenient for our mind and that is why we do that. All right, with that, I think we can close out today's session. I know it was a short session. Uh, we'll continue on our journey from Bhagavad Gita. We'll pick up verses from chapter three next week. Uh, look forward to seeing you there and we will also release short videos of all the seva presentations that have and then start building momentum around the next set of activities that projects that they can take up so thank you everybody appreciate you turning up one hour early today despite a short notice and have a great weekend please join us from ram navmi celebrations tomorrow and the angels meeting if you're an angel in a three or four minutes from now uh, I'll see you in that session as well. So Radhe Radhe, good day, good good, and great rest of your evening from my side. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Radhe Radhe. Radhe Radhe.